Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. This is Nate Miller. I'm the founder and CEO of Proving Ground, and we're going to go ahead and get started on this webinar session about centralizing your building information model data. Um, if anyone has any questions throughout this session, feel free to enter them into the question and answer section of the, the Zoom call, Zoom webinar here. Um, and if you have general comments, uh, feel free to type them into the chat. Um, I'm joined here by Steve Sanda, who will be kind of helping to moderate the discussion and um, answer questions as they pop up. And then as I get through the presentation towards the end, we'll have a more and a formal Q&A session uh, where I'll respond to, to stuff that maybe didn't get answers to uh, as we went along in this presentation. So thanks everyone for joining. Um, I think in, in the spirit of bringing maybe some newcomers up to speed. Um, I have been running these webinar sessions throughout the year, um, highlighting both some of the products that we make at Proving Ground, but also introducing some higher level concepts. And so I would say that this, this session is, I, I wanna say the third webinar in a series of more topical sessions. Um, I did a session in May on the concept of business intelligence and what that can bring to the building design and construction workflow. Um, and, and more recently in September, I did a session on digital twins and kind of practical implementation strategies. Um, and this session will kind of round out 2021 with a, with a kind of a very practical overview of a rather mature concept um, for centralizing data. Um, and then we'll be taking that concept and applying it to the world of building information models. So just uh, to get some formalities out of the way, um, we are a group called Proving Ground. Uh, we believe in this idea of a data-driven building industry. And what that means to us is this idea that building design and construction professionals are able to use data to make better decisions about the built environment. Um, both in terms of the way that that built environment gets delivered, but also in terms of how that built environment gets operated and maintained in the long term. Um, and that usually involves both a combination of technology, we believe, but also the adoption of certain evidence-based processes. And so what you'll often see as we go through presentations like this is maybe a balancing of kind of higher level issues as it relates to adopting these kinds of methodologies, but also a coupling with technology that can really help drive uh, these ideas forward. In some ways, the concept of today related to uh, data centralization really stems from similar motivating factors and underpinnings uh, that we, I explored in past talk about business intelligence and digital twins. And that's the idea of addressing the data deluge uh, that's present uh, in our industry of, of building design and construction. And so we'll kind of be covering some some familiar ground here on this topic, but the idea that when we when it comes to identifying data sources that are relevant to our, our industry, there's this kind of idea of identifying the sources of information that are present in our workflow. And you know, when we engage in a, in a given project, we might encounter dozens, if not hundreds of potential sources of information that we need to correlate and track and understand. Um, then as our kind of business progresses and our, as our projects progress, you know, we find that the owners of the data is also a moving target for many uh, projects. You know, there's data being handed off, there's data being shared, exchanged um, at different stages of design, new data is being constantly created by, you know, different parties. And so we have to understand um, kind of the levels of responsibility and, and track this moving target of ownership as well as the idea of data relationships themselves, sort of the underlying technical relationships that can be established between various data sources. Um, it's no secret to, I think, many on this call and, and, and many professionals that have worked in this industry for a while that our data tends to be quite siloed and disconnected, um, sometimes situating, themselves, situating itself inside of various proprietary platforms and, and kind of other black box kind of environments. And so it's sometimes not as clear how data might interrelate. Um, and so that's yet another kind of area that 
that we uh, are very keen um, in addressing through these dialogues about technology. And that kind of leads me to then the, the topic of data centralization. If we kind of understand the current context of our, of our industry um, and our, we understand that data itself is often decentralized and siloed away, um, a big question in our mind is what does it mean to bring this data together? What does it mean to take stuff that is decentralized, but maybe doesn't need to be decentralized and actually would benefit from a, a, a centralization strategy. And so what data centralization refers to is a, both a strategy and a technology for collecting, storing, and maintaining data in one location. Um, this concept is applicable in some contexts, but may not be applicable in others. Um, and when we look at the idea of decentralized data, um, you know, the, and, and we look at areas in our building industry where there is the sort of decentralization occurring, uh, might be among different file types or, you know, model information sources, uh, building information um, models themselves, you know, we might be able to identify groupings of data types and data sources that may want to become, you know, a single uh, location of sorts. And that's kind of an, an area that we've identified as being a potential opportunity for data centralization is the area of building information modeling data itself. Um, even today, as we kind of, even as we're using cloud-based uh, technology for collaborating on building information models, such as you know, Revit and, and BIM 360 uh, virtually, um, we are still fundamentally using kind of a file-based um, mode of operating on our building information um, and you know, sharing it and collaborating on it, whether it's you know, on our local server and there's central models or even in BIM 360 where the central model is virtualized and there's this way of you know, remote um, uh, connections and, and collaborations. With that said, there seems to be an opportunity for us to devise platforms, um, experiences, and reporting mechanisms that would allow us to bring this data together um, and, and do so in a way that is structured and reliable um, and allows for businesses to take advantage of their building information models in a way that they couldn't previously do, um, even, even in, as new cloud systems become uh, more prevalent. So when, when it comes to this idea of, of the data centralization strategy, we're really looking at a couple of key motivators. One is this idea of a single source of truth, the idea that we can take um, a multitude of models and multitude of projects and bring them together under kind of one um, kind of structured data scheme. And in doing so, uh, we can make data that is oftentimes siloed in the form of proprietary environments, um, such as the Revit file format, um, more accessible. We can, we can unlock uh, that stuff that's hidden away in, in our files and, and try to make sense of it, use it for different purposes, which we'll be talking about. There's also this idea of establishing these resources that can enable a kind of data-driven thinking and business culture. Um, I think one of the kind of technical limitations that is often present in, in many businesses today is that people know and maybe understand intuitively sense that they have um, value in a data-driven exercise, but they don't necessarily have um, the resources available to them to act, make, make that data actionable. And data sometimes is talked about in, in a much more abstract sense. Um, here, we're talking about establishing a really tangible set of resources um, that can drive thinking and, and help uh, people understand the, the impact that a, a, data, you know, a data set can have on their business and how they might run a project. Um, and then there's this idea of supporting data standards and quality. I think one of the things I'll be highlighting later on is that by moving your information, like your, your models and, and other uh, related information into a centralized data environment, the quality of your data all of a sudden becomes very, very apparent. And it can also start to inform how you think about, okay, if our data quality is in this state currently, um, by having things in a data environment, we can actually establish standards and tactics that will allow quality to improve over time. So that uh, 
brings us to the idea specifically about building information model data, a BIM data uh, component to all of this. So when we think about data centralization, um, the idea itself is quite old. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty mature kind of IT related tactic where, hey, we have multiple sources of information. It might be in an enterprise resource planning system. It might be in a um, cost analysis system. It might be in a, um, you know, a, you know, time tracking system, um, an accounting system, financial systems and such, and bringing things together in those contexts, you know, there are numerous solutions out there that allow you to, to do this. And IT, IT groups will employ different tactics to connect those things together. Uh, building information model data is an area that is growing in maturity, um, but, you know, there's not uh, the, the kind of number of solutions out there for centralizing this data uh, is still quite rare, I would say. You know, a lot of people are building maybe maybe more bespoke uh, frameworks internally in their firms. Um, there might be you know a couple of uh, products on the market that you know touch on different ways with which this data can be kind of uh, more readily accessed. But we're we're kind of looking at this from the standpoint of um, creating a very kind of structured analytic analytical framework. Um, and it really has its origins in a product that is currently that we've currently put out on the market um, called Tracer. Um, Tracer is a toolkit um, that's standalone um, that allows us to harvest information out of a building information model into a kind of structured relational database language. So if we think about a, a Revit model, for example, a Revit model is itself a database. It's, a, it's kind of a proprietary database. Um, and we need to basically harvest and extract this information out of the model into a database that other um, environments can more readily understand and have open access to. And so this, this product that we have out in the wild at the moment is called uh, Tracer and it um, really performs these kind of one-time single document harvests and creates kind of a file-based uh, open uh, SQLite database, um, not to get too technical or in the weeds there, but what that means is that, you know, we're producing files that can be attached into places like business intelligence environments. Um, so you can perform a kind of model analysis, right? And it's really meant to be kind of a standalone workflow that doesn't have infrastructure um, attached to it. And you can kind of download and try out, um, but it doesn't have any kind of a pretense that it's centralizing all of your building information data. But it, the way that we're exporting and harvesting the data and um, leveraging that information in places like Power BI um, and more broadly business intelligence environments start to point to clues to how we might start to scale this. So the, the standard version is really about that local file export. There's no infrastructure. It's built for an agile workflow for a user, and it has an extremely low barrier to entry, um, in, meaning that someone can download the product, install it, go through the process of harvesting and building up a, a report without having to learn how to code or, or do, you know, kind of uh, highly specialized tasks like making a website. Um, it's really meant for that kind of, uh, you know, low barrier to entry workflow. Tracer server takes the same concept, but scales it to the level where we're now talking about similar processes of harvesting data, um, attaching it to analytical environments like Power BI, uh, but we're doing so in a way that allows us to combine portfolios of models together um, and do so in a way where that allows for a consistent um, export harvest and analysis type of scheme. And at a technical level, it involves, you know, more infrastructure, but it's infrastructure that is really aimed not at a single user, but at an enterprise uh, environment. So you can imagine that there's business, um, whether you're an architect or an owner or a construction company, where you have this need of, hey, we have these projects, we want to be able to bring this data out into an environment uh, that can serve as an enterprise resource. Um, and so I'll be kind of talking through some of these components, but in general, what this means is that we have frameworks uh, that allow us to submit models to automated harvesting environments. Um, this environment serves up a database that can then uh, be attached to places like business intelligence that would allow for kind of multi-project, multi-model analysis. So 
This is scaling to an enterprise infrastructure. Um, it scales to a portfolio of models, not just one model. It allows for centralized access to building information model data. And um, as you'll see, we, we often work with organizations to tie these types of resources into a larger firm data strategy. Um, but the first component to all of this is how you bring your model data out. How do you, how do you, how can you establish a system that is repeatable um, and can allow for models to come out um, at scale? So one of the things that we've uh, really done here is established a kind of a centralized portal um, that allows users to manage how they want data to be exported and harvest. So we've developed technology that allows for Revit to be virtualized. Um, and then we're using a portal to send uh, essentially harvesting instructions uh, to, the, to that virtual harvesting environment um, such that you can upload multiple models, um, tag those models with different um, conditions, like is this a facilities management model? Is this an architectural design model? What project does this model belong to? Um, and these tags allow the user to kind of harvest and then ultimately you know, index their models in a, in a centralized data environment. We've also uh, built out more kind of customized versions of this uh, that you know, allow for models to be harvested out of BIM 360, for example, um, into this the same environment. Um, but at like kind of a baseline, what we're looking at here is just the ability to kind of attach and send model harvest requests um, and have that that model data end up in in your data environment for analysis in a centralized way. Um, the kind of idea of the portal also introduces this ability to kind of configure settings for your particular use case. So you can, for example, understand which models have been harvested, but then you can also understand, you know, what presets of data extraction do you really want to have? Um, it may be important for an organization to grab all attributes out of, out of, a, of a set of models and have them stored at a central location. Um, other organizations might only need a couple of key data points uh, that reflect their specific use case. And so this kind of administrative side of our harvesting framework allows users to um, really define what their, what their presets are going to be and how they can align the model data with what their end goal is, is ultimately is for having access to this model data. So the model data itself that comes out of this harvesting framework is rather comprehensive, or it can be as, I guess, comprehensive as you want it to be depending on your particular use case. But what we're able to get to out of this centralized harvesting approach um, is that you can have element property data. Um, so every, a Revit environment has listings of elements and their properties. Um, and what we want to do is, you know, be able to pull those element records forward and get access to all the underlying parameters for an object. Um, so we can, you know, run analysis on, you know, the, the basically the content of the model. We're also exporting uh, location information of the objects. So for example, if you wanted room boundaries, um, and area boundaries to, to be represented in a reporting environment um, and have those displayed and visualized. We're getting access to that information. We're also storing three-dimensional mesh data reflecting you know, volumes and family geometry and other types of geometry that might be in the model. And then another part of this um, experience is the visualization tools that we've been building up for environments like Power BI, which allow us to, out of the database, render 2D and 3D uh, information um, and have them be part of the uh, experience of interacting with your data in a report manner. So to kind of give you an idea of the flavor of this, you can kind of imagine that inside of this database, we're indexing elements across a portfolio of models um, we're getting properties, but then we're also getting these geometric records. And this is where some of the kind of foundational technology from Tracer uh, standard that you can download right now in a kind of more of a standalone form on our website gets you. But this idea that um, data records can be treated as both, or you know, geometry records can be treated as other forms of data, like, you know, um, 
numeric or text-based information. We're essentially allowing for a drag and drop experience of certain records. So you can build up your report and build out three-dimensional representations of the information straight from the database in places like Power BI. Um, one of the things that, you know, as I start to get into some specific use cases that I really wanted to address here, though, as we go down this process of harvesting information and, you know, really reporting on it is a question of data quality. And this, <laughs> this kind of use case is in some ways fundamental. It's, it's really the, um, you know, one of the kind of initial use cases that we as Proving Ground developed um, and thought through uh, when it came to how we provide kind of consulting and um, kind of advising to our clients to establish data standards. And one of the things that becomes apparent as people um, and users put their information into a data environment is that how often unstructured or kind of uh, disorganized or inconsistent data points typically are. Um, you quickly realize when you see your, um, when you try to query your information through a database like Tracer Server, um, if people are complying with certain data standards that your firm has been putting forward, or even just general modeling standards. Um, I pulled forward a couple of snapshots of some reports that we, we had done in the past that just look at something as simple as naming conventions um, on, on objects and how complete um, object data is being filled out as the um, rapid pace of architectural design production and construction moves forward. Um, and you can kind of, we can kind of see and, you know, having popped the hood on uh, the engines of many, many firms, we've, we've started to learn and understand, you know, how data can become misaligned with, with certain standards. Um, and, you know, this use case allows us to really understand compliance. And this, in this case, what we're looking at is a, a reporting that shows that only, you know, in, in this particular, for this particular client, 45% of families um, in kind of prototypical templates didn't actually follow the, the naming structure that was recommended by, you know, the, the firm's uh, technology group, which downstream, you know, maybe for the project, that's okay. They're getting the project out the door, but downstream, if you're thinking about reusing this kind of, kind of information in a kind of proper life cycle or kind of portfolio management context, you want these things to kind of be present. Um, and so that leads us to some possible use cases um, for using this information, um, <clears throat> not only from a QAQC standpoint, that was kind of the use case I just showed um, in, in some of those snapshots, but how can we start to really leverage this data and experience with the data to deliver some form of business value? Um, and I think that's really important whenever we think about introducing a new kind of technology into a company, especially one that is built around this idea of a platform. Um, like a data centralization platform, which has infrastructure components and has a level of investment in it. You want to make sure that you're driving for use cases that make sense. Um, so I've, I've uh, kind of devised a couple of, of scenarios here on how we might kind of think this through. This first one is really built around the idea of um, just kind of understanding in aggregate your digital model assets. So this first um, uh, slide here is really looking at this idea of model viewing um, and being able to on demand pull forward your portfolio of models and understand um, the elements and properties underlying them in a kind of report like manner. Um, what you're seeing on screen is a snapshot of a Power BI report that is attaching into the centralized database. Um, and as a user is combing through their projects and selecting different projects, the model and its digital assets are being pulled forward. You can start to understand um, the properties of the different elements in the model without having to open Revit or, or use uh, BIM 360 or leverage Forge technology. This is all very kind of standalone um, and contained as a, as a piece of data infrastructure with um, you know, attaching into Power BI. So, um, you have this idea of like, oh, well, I have a question about a model and what was in it, and maybe I need to go into my log and, and find that model and, and get access to the data to answer, answer my question without having to comb through a file system uh, to, find, to find that data. Um, and, you know, maybe I, I need to identify specific elements and, you know, uh, understand what's there. 
Um, another use case might involve this idea of comparisons. And one of the um, um, areas that we've become kind of interested in uh, as, as we think about data-driven culture and data-driven you know, leveraging data that we have in a portfolio is how do you start to compare models? If you are doing certain types of work and you are building up a portfolio of digital assets like this, the question becomes, well, is it possible to look at a history of data points across various models and see how these models compare under different circumstances? So in this case, you're seeing an example report that's composed attached to a central data environment via tracer server to basically compare the blocking and stacking of the models and also understand the kind of programmatic uh, breakdowns that might be in these models. And, you know, you might find yourself, hey, we do a lot of housing. So we want to look across our housing portfolio and identify, you know, what the major trends uh, are uh, in kind of how we design a, a housing project. Or it might involve kind of understanding hospitals or commercial sectors and understanding kind of that, that spatial breakdown. Um, so you can take those ideas to your client and show, hey, you have our, your project is roughly the same size of these five projects over here. We kind of anticipate um, these being kind of programmatic considerations. So um, we're, we're using our portfolio of past models to um, inform your new project. It also might be that your process involves kind of more of a facility management type of experience wherein you are expecting as an owner to get models from your architect. And so a, an environment like tracer server combined with a business intelligence workflow can provide you with this kind of um, support for your facility management um, work. You can take a model from an architect or contractor, get your as built in, and now you have a spatial database with geometry and properties directly from those models um, that is searchable and queryable. There's also like a use case tied in here that looks at the idea of content um, and what's in the model. Um, this is one where in across those um, projects that I was just describing, let's see if I get back to that slide here and pause this, um, uh, that you have certain types of digital assets. You know, they might be doors, windows, furniture, might be different forms of equipment uh, that's stored within these models. Um, and what this kind of centralized data environment allows you to do then is query and parse through the content that is in your portfolio. Um, and so you can start to understand the different attributes and the different um, types of things that are in your projects across a portfolio, not just in one specific project. So that was one, that was kind of a collection of sort of highly generalized use cases where we're like, okay, the ability to recalling model data from a centralized location, the idea of performing comparisons between projects and understanding trends that might be in your, um, your design portfolio or in your facilities portfolio. Um, and then this idea of kind of managing your digital content overall. Um, there is another use case here that really builds upon the topic that I presented back in September on digital twins and practical strategies for leveraging digital twins. Um, this is um, one of the kind of diagrams I presented uh, a number of, um, you know, maybe a, just over a month ago, maybe a month and a half ago on, you know, kind of the infrastructure that might be, might be involved in establishing a digital twin that allocates various data sources, um, both in terms of sensors and intelligent smart devices that might be in a building, but also um, other systems that are used to manage the building and inclusive of digital models and building information models that can kind of provide a scaffold for hosting other types of data to. And so this starts to speak to the idea that if you are trying to realize a digital twin, um, that digital twin needs to be aligned with other potential sources of information. And that information in aggregate starts to form a picture um, of your facilities, the sort of physical world through kind of a digital lens, right? Um, and so when we look at the opportunity then for centralized data environments like Tracer Server, you know, we see this opportunity to sort of say, hey, we're aggregating models from a building information context, we're capturing their geometries. 
um, and then we're combining them with other sources of information so we can um, recall them uh, in a kind of more comprehensive view. So this is an example of a, of a report, uh, proof of concept, looking at a building information model acting as a scaffold for more real-time or regularly updated information about a facility. In this case, looking at team occupancy in a kind of a, an office space, um, looking at you know, when people are coming and going, looking at how the team structure aligns with different types of content in the model. Um, we can start to understand through the centralization of building information data as aligned with um, information about staff themselves, you know, what equipment, what, what assets do they kind of own as an employee, you know, what is their experience like in the space from an environmental comfort uh, standpoint, um, along with their, you know, other, other employee information. Um, and then we can also start to look at environmental factors. So looking at the model adjacent to uh, data sources that may be related to, um, you know, temperature, humidity, and other comfort factors. Um, and then uh, the model uh, as aligned to kind of maintenance uh, plans for the facility. So this type of scenario is made possible not only through the, the provision of centralized data in a um, the context of something like Tracer Server, where your models are served up in a kind of database type of environment, but it also involves aligning that source of information with other sources of data that may be, be relevant uh, to your particular use case. Um, in this case, a kind of construction of a digital twin-like scenario. So that brings me to the topic of implementation. Now, how do you get started or get going on this kind of trajectory? How, you know, when does it make sense? Um, and what are the steps for really implementing these, these tools um, and, and these platforms? Um, and I, I would say, you know, as we've gone through this exercise with um, many of our, our clients now, um, you know, the, these are maybe four bullet points that I can start to suggest that right off the bat, needs to be kind of resolved um, in order to kind of get the value out of a centralized data environment. Number one being what your use cases are um, and understanding how you might leverage this information because that's going to inform so much uh, in terms of what data you go for, you know, go towards harvesting um, and how you start to build out reporting on top of your centralized data environment. So a use case for an architect may be very different than that of an, a building facilities owner, right? But they can still use a kind of a similar data infrastructure. So an architect may be more concerned with um, looking at or looking across their portfolio and looking across at design trends that may exist between buildings in a particular market sector. Um, it also might be analytical and more design driven. So you're looking at kind of design conditions that might be more apparent in a, you know, through data properties that are available in your building information models. Whereas a facility owner may want this kind of centralized uh, data environment so that they can align and use the BIM asset as a way to manage their, their overall facility. So, hey, I wanna identify this room. This room is gonna have some maintenance issues and tasks associated with it. So I need it aligned with my facility management and work ordering system. Uh, or maybe we're going, the, an owner is going through a process of procuring a new facility and they wanna have an environment uh, where they can you know, track model progress and, and track how certain metrics are stacking up you know, relative to their uh, facility goals, right? So very different use cases. Then there's, then there's the question of, well, what is the quality of our data um, and how do we evaluate it? So I think one of the big kind of mistakes is that out of the box, your data is ready to go. Um, and I think as I kind of alluded to before, when you actually start to push your models into a data environment, um, you start to see right away where there may have been corners cut um, in, in maintaining certain data fidelity and, and accuracy. So there is an element here where if you're looking to use your portfolio of models for these use cases, you want to you know, assess to see if you are tracking um, alongside those use cases properly. And if not, you need to start to think about how you're then further standardizing the way with which these digital assets, these model assets are being produced by defining new standards. 
And it's really those like three, I guess, softer areas. Those are kind of strategic in a way is then when you're sort of getting into the definition of your infrastructure and procuring solutions that will help you work through the, um, you know, uh, work through the establishment of this kind of resource. Then there, there are, you know, other considerations. So once you have this kind of infrastructure established, you know, then it becomes like, okay, well, we have the data now, how do we get to it? How do we start to leverage it? And this is where tools and implementations of business intelligence come into play. You know, we're big fans of Power BI and have built out quite a, quite a number of, of technologies that support the kind of Power BI workflow. Um, so it's, it's kind of then about adopting those kinds of business intelligence solutions to really serve up reporting um, and, you know, building out ways of, of viewing and understanding your, your data, which might involve also upskilling your team. So I certainly didn't go into the world of design and construction uh, initially to become a data expert. You know, it's a very different discipline, right? Um, and kind of a very different motivation. Uh, now, as the industry has progressed uh, in, in the years that I've been in it, you, you know, there is now more and more of a need to uh, you know, have experience in synthesizing and understanding data. And tools like Power BI have come along that have helped to democratize the ability to learn these systems and, and leverage analytical capabilities. So there is this kind of upskilling of your team to that that can then inform a data-driven culture, meaning that you now have access to this information, you have this use, these use cases defined, you have these reporting tools that can then be served up to numerous stakeholders in your company um, that, that can support decision-making based on the information. Um, and kind of move us towards a more kind of evidence-based type of uh, workflow as, as, a, as an industry. So um, I'll kind of, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there um, when it comes to like the overall implementation. I will highlight that if you're interested in these topics uh, before we get in the, into the Q&A, um, that, that please reach out if, if you have this kind of need to, um, you know, in explore central uh, centralized BIM data environments like Tracer Server, or you're thinking through your data strategy overall, or thinking about how different topics may be implemented or customized. Um, we're happy to work with you on strategic plans, implementation plans. Um, we have a technology deployment uh, for uh, you know various options for technology deployment of Tracer Server at the enterprise level, and we're equipped to provide. Um, levels of support that can, you know, inform uh, the evolution of your particular impl implementation. So with that, I will kind of open it up to questions. Um, and if there are any questions that have popped into the chat that Steve, you haven't answered, um, I'm happy to address them now. Or Steve, if you have any questions in particular that you think might prompt um, some, some interesting dialogue, you're, uh, more than welcome to ans answer those or comment on what was just presented. Yeah, sure. Um, I guess uh, we'd had some questions come through. Um, there was a question about um, tagging through the portal. Yep. Um, Br Brian asked if that was um, just at the model level or if we can tag elements in the instance level. Ah, sure. So when typically what... Um, what we do, what we kind of have out of the box is that when a, um, a model is uploaded, we're, we're indexing the model itself overall. Um, and I think that's kind of a layer of organization that allows us to um, identify, you know, when a model might be part of a certain market sector or belong to a particular client or a design stage. Um, and that's kind of a layer of organization that doesn't exist out of the box with Revit. And so that's why we've provided that kind of tagging system and that classification system when a model is uploaded. Um, I think the use case that's being described here is like the tagging of elements um, in the model itself. And, you know, are you looking for common um, kind of relationships and things like that at the kind of element level? And I would, I would say that one of the benefits of kind of a structured kind of model environment like Revit 
is that elements themselves already have some some level of classification on them in terms of you know is is something a furniture family or a you know a curtain family or a wall system or or things like that so there's already a level of classification there i would say that the opportunity to tag element categories or tag you know specific types of families is something that our database environment is capable of doing through a level of customization of saying creating lookup tables that kind of map your family categories to um, other types of tagging definitions. And as you get into this world of relational databases and also just general data warehousing um, systems, the idea of, you know, uh, as because the data is now being served up, you can start to establish those relationships to serve your use cases um, in a in a more customized form. Because we, you know, I would I would imagine that you know different organizations may have very different kind of criteria or interests in in how different elements get tagged. Um, but I think we can't underestimate the level of flexibility that comes with just having the data available to us in in the context of kind of an open uh, database environment for your 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 business because you can then build those scenarios in to, to track elements and, and other things. I think there's a lot to be said about classifications, Nate, when it comes to yep. um, elements beyond just categories. Um, yes. And I think setting the stage to uh, being able to compare apples to apples when you're looking at projects that are apples and oranges um, is worthwhile. You know, we've talked a lot and helped some clients um, look at OmniClass to classify rooms and elements um, so that across sectors and portfolio and, and markets rather, um, you can start to understand like types of spaces and things that go into the projects. Um, so you can describe your expertise in a way as you have this repository of, of buildings that sort of reflect types of spaces rather than um, individual sort of use cases um, for projects. Um, and, and, and again, um, just to be clear, you know, tracer server, the underlying sort of paradigm is just to pull whatever is in Revit um, and put that in a database so you can analyze it outside of Revit, right? And so if you have a spot, an instance parameter or a type parameter for specific types of information, you're uncovering that through this process in a database, um, but using Revit largely as the authoring tool for that information. Um, and so this is really a, a carrier of, of data from one spot in Revit to a database on the other end. Absolutely. Um, we just had a question come up in the question and answer. Um, the videos show the visualizations and models loading quite fast. Will it be that fast in real life when you have the whole firm's portfolio loaded into the database? Well, um, it, I guess that's, that's another area that... Um, yeah, you know, the answer is some ways it depends. I mean, it, it uh, the kind of ability to query um, information and the speed with which information is queried is going to come down to you know a number of factors. It's you know you might have a, a very sizable database, but if the specifications that you've put on the sort of MySQL server environment uh, that might be hosting that data um, it are low, um, if they're low specs, then data recall and refresh is going to be you know, not as performative. So as data volume increases, your, you know, your, your infrastructure likely is, is scaling with it. Um, what we have found, uh, and, you know, we've worked with a number of clients that have, you know, pushed, uh, you know, rather high number of models into these systems is, uh, you know, you, you, um, you, know, you might have a, you know, portfolio of like hundreds of projects sitting, sitting there. And, you know, the, the, the strategy is to always kind of keep a keep an eye on both what you're you know what you're looking um, at uh, and the kind of the data that's in there the data volume but you know the specs of the of the, the infrastructure that's running it right so it, there is an IT strategy which kind of lends itself to you know thinking about tracer server as kind of more enterprise infrastructure just like with anything else that has a high data volume need I think there's um, you know, other kind of tactics here that look at that particular kind of condition. Um, and one, you know, in, in a couple of cases, we've worked with our clients by introducing this as part of a larger data warehousing strategy. So, 
um, firms may have, for example, this idea that, hey, we're going to be correlating information coming out of this BIM database with other systems related to project management or cost management or, you know, maintenance and, and facility uh, work orders and things like that. Um, and because it's about a data warehouse at this point, what, what they're kind of doing is saying, hey, we're capturing our Revit information in this source, but we're, we then have these systems for pulling out the key properties and data points that we need to satisfy this overall data warehouse workflow, which then feeds forward into reporting. Um, that allows you to like filter to the stuff you, you need. You can exclude the stuff you don't need at that time to reduce data volume. And then um, because you're calibrating things for your use case, a very specific use case, you can further isolate just the stuff that matters in that case. Cause there is a lot of stuff in a Revit model and there's stuff that you probably will never, ever care about um, in your use case. So it's about figuring out um, tactically what's going to make the most sense and how that contributes to these other factors of, of volume and, and scale of your infrastructure. I see that Dan Tartaglia asked that question. What's up, Dan? Good to, good to hear from you. He's a fellow MBBJ uh, colleague that I worked with uh, uh, a number of years back. Yeah, and to his, to his point in terms of the amount of time needed to extract the data, and if these can be batch processed, I mean, that's the, the idea is to offload this work from a user's computer so that a server can, can handle it. I think we've been seeing harvests from five to 10 minutes for large sizable projects, and the idea with the portal is to batch them, so you just kind of set it and forget it in a way. Yeah, and I think there's there's other kind of ways that we've um, strategize scaling as well. Like you could have, you know, tasks being farmed out to multiple virtual machines um, and sent to a single database. Um, there's also a question of like, okay, well, what things that will also impact um, harvesting time or like the specific data pieces that you're looking to grab out of the, the model itself, right? So if you're only interested in like area volumes and levels, maybe floors um, and rooms, things like that, those harvests are going to go quick because you've all of a sudden isolated, you know, the specific data that you want out of the models. And they'll just be like, okay, we're just, we're just pulling through the, the kind of the programmatic components that are relevant to what we want to analyze. But if you're talking about like full model harvests of extremely large models, those will um, obviously, obviously take longer. But as Steve mentioned, because we're offloading that kind of process to an infrastructural component and not the user's machine, then, um, you know, it kind of becomes a, a bit of a background activity and you're just waiting for the process to complete um, when it's ready. I got a question in the chat. Um, can the Tracer Server database be connected to Semantic or to other generative design tools? Um, we haven't, uh, well, you know, um, we haven't done that kind of activity before, but um, we have done, uh, for example, the use of Tracer Server data to inform a kind of machine learning training set. Um, there's a, a lecture that I've given before that looks at, you know, if you're centralizing your data in this manner and you've got, you know, examples and of, of say your kind of programmatic definition or, you know, certain attributes about a space and that's all now being centralized and you've gone through this application of standards because you're now capturing this information in a data environment, you can all of a sudden think about the opportunity to leverage it for say machine learning um, or AI training um, in some ways, right? Because you've, and, and those technologies are dependent on having, you know, consist, you know, you know, struct, you know, structured information um, where you've identified certain properties such that they can feed training scenarios and then make predictions based on the data. Um, one example that we've done is say like capturing rooms from capturing room data um, areas and, and classifications of rooms across a, a portfolio of models. And then you're using, you know, ML to make predictions on what future program may be for, you know, projects of, you know, similar size or, or makeup. Right. So that I think is kind of most applicable here. Um, I wouldn't say that tracer server is a place where you're really thinking about rapid iteration of 
um, and having there be kind of a rapid iteration of, of design possibilities, but you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule it out. Um, you meant, uh, you mentioned semantic semantic is a Rhino based tool. Um, this is more focused on, you know, the building information model side, um, and capturing, uh, that data. So I don't quite know if there's an alignment there. I could, there certainly, I can certainly see there being scenarios where if you're using uh, an environment like Rhino, you may say like, you know what, I want to pull in um, programmatic information or certain attributes into my Rhino model to facilitate a study, at which point that might make sense. You might have like a database connection being made between Rhino um, and the tracer server database to inform those types of explorations. Or, you know, maybe you're pulling in certain geometries into Grasshopper to build on. Um, which I think is very, very much a, a possibility here. Great. I haven't seen anything else come through. Oh, oh, just kidding. Uh, Dan's asking if we extract our own data to a database, is it possible to analyze the data in Tracer? Dan was also asking for uh, uh, a schema. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. So um, if you if you extract your own data to a database, um, is it possible to analyze the data in Tracer? Um, yeah. So actually, that's a really good point. And I think um, what you're what you're uh, maybe what's being asked is that if you've created your own database platform, could you still leverage things like the tracer visuals like 2D and 3D visuals with that data? And the answer is uh, yes. Uh, what what uh, when, when things kind of end up in the reporting environment like Power BI, um, you're, you know, we're, we're connecting to uh, databases using kind of standard database connection procedures, open database connectivity, for example, um, or like a direct MySQL connector uh, is another one that we use. Um, but what we've done is we have worked with a couple of clients to provide libraries um, that would allow you to, if you're building your own kind of database aggregator, we do have libraries for serializing the kind of geometry components uh, of Revit elements in both a 2D and 3D form that you can fold into your data strategy. Um, we've done that uh, a few times as well. So, you know, that's one of the kind of advantages of being a flexible business um, that has a a basis in consulting and services is that we can kind of work with our, our customers in that manner. Um, in terms of the database structure, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of out there in a way. I mean, if you know, we have the tracer standard product and if you have a look at our, um, you know, SQLite uh, database output from that tool, um, the database structure is, is all there. Right? We're using kind of, almost identical structure on the, on the server side. Um, so um, it's not something that we're necessarily keeping um, a secret necessarily. I mean, it is our data structure and as we would consider it proprietary, but we're not necessarily keeping it as a secret sauce necessarily, because once you have the data output into a database, you can look at the database structure in uh, through an, you know, an EER diagram or through uh, Power BI's relationship manager, right? So yeah, it's there. And we don't have a white paper uh, formally published on it, however. Well, cool, we're, we're about the end of the hour. Um, I wanted to say I appreciate um, everyone joining in and checking things out. Um, oh, one, one question did pop in. And Tracer and Tracer Server packaged together. If you're a Tracer customer, are there different? Yeah, so a Tracer server is a very different product in terms of its deployment and its um, implementation than uh, Tracer standard. Tracer um, is the kind of self-contained workflow. There is no uh, database server or client. You're basically doing single model exports out to an SQLite database. Um, Tracer server um, builds on the technology and creates a scalable centralized database environment. So we're talking about working with a, uh, a customer to establish a database um, either on like place like Azure or on premises. Uh, then we're deploying web portals for, you know, automating the harvest tasks. So there's uh, quite a bit more of an investment and in involvement and it all comes down to if it 
uh, you know, makes sense for your organization to scale uh, in that manner. So uh, good question. Um, Tracer and Tracer Server are different products. Okay, uh, well, uh, thanks everybody uh, for, for joining in. And I uh, hope you got out, you know, got something out of this uh, presentation um, when it comes to what centralized uh, data can do for your, your company um, and for your business and, and why you might in, the, in, in a general sense go down this path of, you know, using that type of, of framework to enhance your ability to deliver value with data. So have a great afternoon, have a, have a nice weekend and uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions and you know, obviously feel free to visit our website and, uh, you know, kick the tires on some of our tools. So thank you very much. Thanks everyone.